welcome to another edition of our Four Questions Journalist Spotlight. We are talking today with Martel Sharp, who, uh, among other things, is managing editor with the uh, the Voice, the Atlanta Voice, here in, in Metro Atlanta. Good afternoon, Martel. Good to see you. Good afternoon, Mitch. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Well, I, uh, I appreciate you taking the time. I wanted to. I know you and I have. Uh, Worked together and emailed and talked uh, over over the over the years, but I thought this is a great opportunity for us to get into a little more detail and let folks know kind of what you're working on and uh, how they can work with you, get a few of her stories. But so let's start by uh, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your what's your background and uh, kind of career trajectory that's brought you to to this lofty point where you are now? <laughs> Well, um, right now I am the managing editor of publishing at the Atlanta West newspaper, a 56-year-old uh, African-American newspaper based here in Atlanta. Um, and basically, uh, managing editor of publishing just means that I oversee the print edition that comes out every week. So, weekly news press. Um, my journey to news and to journalism really came, uh, it, it's actually kind of a long story, but I tried to cut it as short as possible. Uh, as a child, I, was, I could always write well. And so my father, he was the first person to say, like, you should be a writer, you're going to be a writer. And I didn't believe him. And uh, I was in elementary school. I was like, I'm, I'm going to be an attorney. <laughs> and I kind of kept with that thought <laughs> all throughout, you know, uh, high school and even in college. I went to college um, to be a political science major at pre-law and um, kind of fell off the pre-law path and then uh, just graduated with a degree in political science. So um, unfortunately, I graduated in 2013, you know, uh, towards the you know, middle tail end of the um, recession. So I, I fell into the uh, underemployment hole <laughs> where, you know, people, uh, they were getting jobs that were, you know, less than what they thought they would get or um, that weren't necessarily in their field. So I kind of found journalism by way of public relations first. Um, I started working in public relations, um, worked in it for a couple of years, um, did some freelance PR work, um, worked with a couple of agencies here in Atlanta. And then um, at one point, you know, I just decided to start freelance writing. So my freelance writing career started with um, like celebrity gossip and stuff like that, which was really cool because all they require you to do is write like 300 words. And, you know, as writers, we can turn that down in like a millisecond. And then they pay you like right there on the spot. And so I was getting paid. <laughs> I was starting out like five pieces in the morning, getting paid in the afternoon and spending the money at night. So it's just a really cool lifestyle to live as a freelance writer um, in gossip. And then um, some people started to see my work, so I kind of started doing like lifestyle and entertainment stuff. Um, when you're at home and you're a freelance writer, you're not really going anywhere. One of the things that you might find yourself doing is watching a lot of TV. So I was watching a lot of reality shows. So one publication you know, was paying me to write recaps about reality. So I was doing that. And then um, another publication um, asked me to be editor for. Um, men's lifestyle so i started you know starting doing that was my foray into like interviewing and stuff like that i had never interviewed before that so out the gate i was interviewing celebrities athletes you know prominent people um, so that was cool <laughs> and then um after a while um, i saw online that there was a post for um, freelance writers for the atlanta boys um, i came in um, they liked what i could do and um, what i wanted to do so um, they brought me in as a freelancer. Um, later on down the line, um, there was an opening for a copy editor position, so I threw my hat in for that. And then, you know, through the natural um, way of how, orga how orga uh, organizations work. So um, basically what happened was um, the Atlanta Boys have been in a period of rebranding for like the last couple of years. And we're still kind of in it. Um, where the organization has been shifting, trying new things, developing new things, you know, really, um, but it really came alive and people were really starting to notice. So um, through that period, you know, some people were coming, some people were going, some people held positions and it released them and stuff like that. So um, the former managing editor ended up leaving, which made the copy editor go up into that, that position. I threw my hat in to be a copy editor, so I got that position. Um, then after a while, um, not even after a while, uh, that managing editor, he left. And so 
we moved another person, uh, the former director of photography, into the managing editor position. Then they realized that I could do a lot more than what I said I could do. <laughs> so they <laughs> so they moved me into like a more permanent manager, uh, not even man like editing position. And then they just created a whole title called Managing Editor of Publishing, where it's two silos. So one is the uh, former, the person who became managing editor, he now is over digital online video, and I'm over everything for him. So that's <laughs> kind of how I got here. Yeah, that's a problem when you when your boss realizes you can do good work and uh, they ask you to do more good work. Well, the great thing is that when you have a contract, you can say no. <laughs> so they offer so they offer you more yeah. money and, and to do more stuff. So, how would you describe the the mission, the focus of the Atlanta Voice? The Atlanta Voice, as the African American newspaper, we follow the vision behind uh, what J. L. Ware started. Um, when he created the paper along with um, Zanola Clayton's um, former husband. Um, so um, the vision is really to uh, provide information vital to the African-American citizens of Atlanta. And that's really through um, politics, uh, community, and business. Um, we do, we are, we're very popular and known for our sports um, stuff, but that's not the priority. And we do do some entertainment stuff, but that's not the priority priority is to bring information to the uh, African-American citizens of Atlanta. And um, some of those subjects would be anything that's happening, you know, anything that's happening within Jewish politics will most likely uh, be of interest to, you know, African-American citizens because they influence the, how their decisions are made. Um, so we provide information so that they can make better decisions, be more informed, and um, really be great um, citizens. So, you know. Okay. Cool. Martel, can you move the microphone a little bit closer to you? Am I? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, there you go. There you go. That, help, that's help, that help with the ambient <laughs> noise a little bit. There you go. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, that's good. I, I want people to have kind of a, a clear feel for what the what the voice is and, and as importantly, what the voice isn't. You know, I guess yeah. people may think, oh, I can pitch the story to the voice. And, you know, a lot of times it's like, okay, this is not fitting our audience right and you know the funny thing about that is that just to go a little bit into that um we ourselves like i said we're in the we've been in this rebranding phase and you know our publisher is the second generation owner so her her father was the person who created the um, Atlanta voice and even through her allowing the process of rebranding happening you know we try different things we try you know new things and see what type of um content our audiences love and, uh, and don't like and we just found that like our tried and true um, of all the things we tried you know political community, politics community and um, business are just like the things that they really resonate with because when we don't focus on that you know we get letters sent to our office angry angry letters uh, calling us out you know because we still have uh, a generation that's still alive of people who read the Atlanta Voice every single week uh, when it comes on newsstands so you know we can put certain things we can get away with online but you know in the print issue there's certain things you just can't get away with so we, we've learned that <laughs> so do, is, is your content um does the digital edition mirror the print edition or there is there additional content on digital that you won't see in the print edition there's always additional content on digital that you won't see in the print edition um so yeah, there, definitely that. Um, and it, oh, of course, as you know, you, you know, you're in journalism. You know, advertising takes take space. So sometimes it's a story that we may want to be in there that may not be the top priority, but it's a great story. And because of advertising space for that week, we might have to push it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that you know, if you don't have, don't have the ad space, you don't have the editorial space. That's that's how uh, that's how newspapers work. Well, that's a good problem to have. So if we have a lot of ads that week, you know, we probably would have a little less content um, to add in because of all the ads. So that's a good problem because that means that money's coming in. It's a bad right. problem. It means yep. that less stories that we want to see gets in. So it's just a good balancing act to have, you know. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, <clears throat> so obviously the, the pandemic has probably affected kind of how, how you work and how you report. How, from a, your personal perspective, how has it affected how you're, gathering stories and doing interviews and interacting with with uh, sources 
So an interesting thing, um, it hasn't really affected really at all. Um, at the beginning of this year, um, I was switching some things around personally and um, really defining the way that I wanted to work. And so I was taking more of a remote approach to working um, where um, I was just coming into the office maybe Wednesday and Thursdays because um, in my world, Wednesdays and Thursdays are the biggest days when it comes to print. Thursday is the day that we send it to the printer. Wednesday is the day that everything comes together and, you know, whatever it is left over on Thursday. So really, um, I have the do not call me on Thursday <laughs> type of mentality. So I'll come into the office on Thursday. I'll come in on Wednesday. But Monday, Tuesday, Friday, um, I'm just, you know, gathering stories as I would on any day. So um, it, it really hasn't affected me that much. And then as a team, it really hasn't affected us too much either because um, we we didn't we kind of all in our own way work remotely, but we gather and come into the office a lot. But um, we've been able to see that we've been able to provide a lot of coverage um, without coming into the office. Though we do miss the office and we do want to come back, um, we've been able to really get a lot done. Um, during this time away from each other. And we still have, you know, weekly um, Zoom meetings, which I hate. And we still have, uh, we still converse and we still communicate and we still have been getting stuff done. And we've been thriving in this space. Um, so a lot of good things have came for the Olympics uh, during this time. So, uh, yeah, obviously the, you know, with your, your Af with, with your focus and with what's happening with social justice and Black Lives Matter and, and all these issues, those issues have come to the forefront even more. Is there a particular, and I know you guys have written a lot of stories <laughs> on, on, this, on these topics, is there a particular story that kind of has resonated for you where you've thought, you know, I'm glad we're able to, to tell this story and, and share this information? Um, we've done a lot of great informative stories, you know, for COVID and for uh, racial injustice and things like that. But when I really think about um, that that sort of uh, type of story, I really think about a story that um, I wrote written recently, and it wasn't even for the Atlanta Voice. It was for um, uh, some company that reached out to me to um, write a piece about social, something about the, at the international community. It was basically about the international community and their response to um, the things that were happening with Black Lives Matter and social injustice in America. And usually, when I when I go into a piece like that, I'm not even I'm more so regurgitating thoughts in my mind and stuff like that. Whereas you know, doing research and things of that nature, really, it, it was less of a news story and more of a thoughts op-ed type of thing. And I really thought, you know, if you really look at the history of this country and um, the things that have happened and um, you know, just throughout history, this was the first time that the international community ever stood up for black people in America. The first time ever. If you go through 200 years plus worth of history, you know, we fought in wars for um, other country, in other countries. We fought for their um, freedoms. We fought for um, their governments to change. We provided aid to them in monetary forms, in um, people and capital. We've helped, uh, you know, just, we've divested in other countries, helped us mental apartheid we've done so much in almost every continent across this um earth in almost every country as citizens of the united states that no country has ever stood up to the united states government for us not one yeah until now <clears throat> so that that was just something that i just found astonishing so i wrote about that you know <laughs> experience and just you know the thought process behind the first time that anybody has ever, you know, fought for black people in America as black Americans. Right, right. So looking looking forward, is there a story in the back of your head that you really want to write that you just haven't quite gotten to yet? I don't plan that far in advance. I really don't. <laughs> okay. People think I, I, I don't really keep... Um, and the other was we we do plan, uh, but and we keep we, we plan more so in the head for cover stories, um, with the understanding that news on the daily changes, uh, and we do have some evergreen stuff that we do check into, but um, we're more of the um, get it get it go type of people. But for me personally, I don't keep to. I, 
I have an incredible amount of freedom at the end of the incredible amount of freedom in my um, career to where if I see a story, I can go ahead and write it up right there on the spot. And I can find if it, you know, if it doesn't fit the Atlanta voice, I can find somewhere for it to fit. Uh, so uh, right. there's nothing that, you know, that really is catching my eye right now that I really want to write. I just, you know, I'm going through the most of stuff, you know, writing things that need to be written right now, written. But um, one thing that really impacted me was the story um, that I did recently. It was a cover story with Marta. It was called Marta Heroes. Um, it was basically about I'm, anybody that knows me knows I'm the biggest fan of Marta. I love everything that they do over there. Um, and so I was perusing their website, you know, looking at press releases and stuff. And I saw that um, they had this video program that they were putting on YouTube. And it was showing not just showing the um, people who you know work at Marta, but incorporating some of the policies that they were doing during vo uh, COVID into these stories and allowing the people who work there to demonstrate what the policies were. And they were showing the um, sprayers that they've been using that were donated to them by Delta. They've been showing, you know, a lot of the cleaning, you know, a lot, just a lot of stuff through um, people who work there, just everyday people. And I just found this series to be very fascinating. So I reached out. I, I originally wrote the story based on my own research in my uh, in the press release, and I presented it to the team, and they thought it would make a great cover story. So then, you know, quick turnaround, I had to call uh, Marta's. Um, communications person Stephanie uh, over there and had to get an interview with the guy who was in digital um, media who created the whole series and so it made a great story and I enjoyed um, that thoroughly. Cool, cool. Um, so uh, kind of a uh, you know kind of the, the fun 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 about Martell section of our of our show here. Uh, let's see favorite uh, favorite book uh, that you've read recently? The last book that I remember that I read, because I, I read a lot, um, probably Sag Harbor. Um, it's a, 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 a novel about um, some uh, boys who have a summer in Sag Harbor and all the things that they get. So that's probably the last one. Sag Harbor up in, up in New York? Yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up in that area. I remember going to Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt's house up in Sag Harbor there. Oh, so. awesome. Cool, cool house. Um, okay, so favorite restaurant that you want to go back to when you can go actually sit in restaurants? I just was telling someone that I can't wait to go back to um, Egg Harbor. Um, it's a brunch spot here in Buckhead. They have a couple of different locations, but um, the one in Buckhead is uh, superb, even though they, they do great brunch. All right. Um, let's see. Favorite guilty pleasure? Um, and you're allowed to say I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's nothing I want to. Talk oh, okay. I, I just thought about one. So um, very people, few people know this, but uh, one of my guilty pleasures. I love uh, because I was a political science major, all that stuff. I love uh, the history of European monarchs. So um, I watch <laughs> the cr the Crown whenever it comes back um, when the movies come out of the I, I didn't really watch tv or movies but like when mary queen of scots came out um i think catherine the great was supposed to come out this year uh i know they came out with like a series for her but they did they were doing a movie and so that's supposed to come out so i want to see that and uh yeah i just think i just i'm fascinated with european all right um favorite local getaway i don't have a favorite local getaway but uh I have to, like favorite work spots because I work yeah, there all you the go. time. There you go. What's your, so, what's your favorite, um, favorite work spot? There you go. One of my favorites is um, if you've ever been in Midtown where um, Georgia Tech is, the Barnes and Nobles, and you go up top, um, it's like a, a student area where you can just sit, but they have free Wi-Fi. You can um, sit there, no one will bother you. Um, there's Starbucks at the bottom, and there's a lot of food places around, so it's a great um, place to work at. Is that the one at Spring and Eighth? Yeah. Yeah. Spring and Fifth. Fifth. Spring and Fifth. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So those are the. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, coolest thing about you? How about that? What's the coolest thing about Martell? Cool. <laughs> What's the coolest thing? I don't you know, have any. 
I don't have any. All right. Cool things about me. I mean, I'm right, pretty well, yeah. straightforward. We'll, we'll come. We may, we may come back to that. We, okay. We may get we may get some viewer comments about. There's Mark Trill is cool because so we, we we always welcome viewer feedback too. So if you're a viewer and you know something about Martel that's cool, then you know just send us a response right now and we'll plug it in the comment section. Uh, are there other are there other publications that you are writing for now that we want, might want to mention? Um, if I remember any of them, uh, <laughs> I only remember that when the paycheck comes. Uh, yeah. I just started. Um, a writing partnership with the Q Gentleman. It's a uh, African American men's um, but online publication. I believe they have a print edition as well. Um, but I just really started with them like last week or something like that. Um, I sometimes contribute to um, Atlanta Best Media, who um, is they publish a lot of local stuff like My Buckhead, My Cobb, My right. Cobb, right. all that stuff. My Home Improvement. So I've contributed to them. Um, I think that's all for okay. right now. I mean, I've contributed to rolling out, you know, a couple of times. I've contributed. Yeah. I've contributed to a lot of publications, but I don't do it regularly. Uh, I really <laughs> just focus on the Atlanta Boys. And, okay. Um, like so, so if someone if someone thinks they have a good story idea for the for the voice, are, are you the best person to send that idea to? I'm one of the best people. Um, I like to think that I usually um, give a good, quick turnaround on stories yep. and. Uh, a great um, feedback on stories and stuff like that. I've never had a person that's disappointed <laughs> at one of the stories <laughs> that I wrote or the way that I portrayed them or uh, the way that I've written about their stories. So it's really um, good. Yeah, it's, it's, always, it's always good to kind of know who the who the contact person is at a publication. Sometimes it's the editor, sometimes it's a senior writer, sometimes it's the managing editor. So I always like to ask that question because sometimes the editor's like yeah i don't you know i'm not really the person who's fielding all that i don't send that to martel you know that kind of thing well here's the thing we're a very small staff so really we only have three editors and that's the editor-in-chief and then two managing editors so yeah. um you can send it to any one of us it just depends on who do you think you're going to get an answer back from <laughs> sure, sure. and uh nine times a time, usually not to you know put them down but you you know they're busy they have a lot that they're doing and so i'm usually glued to my laptop and to my email so i'm usually the person to give a quicker turn around or okay. answer let's yeah. see so the other the other managing editor is so um Itoro Umunsen, and he is the managing editor of digital, so he's over photography, um, videography, and the website. Um, he also does some great sports reporting, and he does some great uh, political um, coverage as well. He, uh, right. he was just at John Lewis's funeral yesterday, so yeah. Cool. And your editor is? Give, uh, Editor-in-chief is Marshall Lattimore, um, all around, you know, great writer, great um, director. Um, he can turn around anything fast, you know, and, um, he can do a lot. He, we call him the Renaissance man because he has a lot of things that he can do um, underneath his hat, but we try to make him sit down a little bit more and, <laughs> and do a lot less. So we're trying, we're working on having him do a lot less. But yeah, but we're just, we're, uh, besides us three editors, you know, we really, um, right at this point right now we, we work with freelancers so um if one of the three of us can't write it then usually a freelancer will write it if we don't right. have a freelancer to write it then it's just us so right. um, yeah okay cool thank you um we've been talking with martel sharp all around uh, cool guy and we'll figure out we're gonna find the cool the coolest thing about him we're gonna we add that in later and uh with the atlanta voice and uh thanks everybody for tuning in to another edition of our Four Questions Journalist Spotlight. We will be back uh, next week with another interview. I'm not sure who that's going to be, but it'll be somebody cool and fun. And until then, we'll see you then. Have a great week.